Hi everyone, it's Kent McCrony here from Enterprise Lab. I hope you're well. Wow, what a start to Monday. Monday, Monday, Monday. Who's got the Monday blues today? You know, it's just been it's been an immense day already for a fall. So we're, we're gonna we've got an explosive start for Monday for you. I have got the one and the only Simone Vincenzi in the house today. I am telling you, this guy is just literally off the back of winning. Uh, I believe it's the APCTC uh, award for yeah. the speaker. You did, you did well. <laughs> That's a difficult part of the award. <laughs> the Speaker of the Year 2016. What can I say about this guy? I've known him for a number of years. This guy is exploding all over the place. Everywhere I go, do you know who Simone is? Everywhere I go, it's a case of Simone's hosting an event. This guy is tireless. Weekend after weekend, doing events after events, programs after programs. I mean, I don't even know if this guy ever sleeps, if he gets to wash his lovely curly hair that he what has. Did say, what, what did you say? What was that word? Sleep. Sleep, yeah. I'm, I'm not familiar with that tell me more does it work i don't know i don't know either simone fantastic to have you on the show thank you very much for accepting to come on um i'm sure there's a lot of people watching this already but for those who don't know who you are it was uh, it would be great if you can give us a, a very brief intro into who simone vincenzi is over to you of course of course, Ketan. Thank you very much for having me on uh, the League of Disruptor show. I'm, I feel honored. I feel I'm a disruptor now. Yes! Okay. <laughs> Not, uh, about me, I'm really passionate about uh, helping uh, other speakers, coaches and trainers creating events that sell. Because uh, I think that the personal development industry needs to change. Uh, I've been uh, uh, sitting in uh, thousands of events and uh, speaking in more hundreds of events and some of them were great and some of them were a pain in the ass so what i wanted to do is actually understanding what makes a great event and what makes a great event that sells and i think that we've all been in this kind of seminar room where people are selling and selling and selling the only thing you want to do is actually cutting your wrist and leave the room right? <laughs> i'm sure you are familiar with that so um, what I set myself up to do is to say, actually, how can we create incredible events that are experiences for the participants and at the same time make a lot of money? And that's what I've been discovered, that's what I've been doing for myself, and that's what I've been teaching to, to my clients. Um, also, I've been sharing the stage. I mean, I, I do more than 200 events a year. 200 <laughs> events? <laughs> <laughs> it's, been a, it's been an intense couple of years for the past three years. Uh, 200 events last year, 200 events this year, one more, one less. Uh, we are talking about the number. So I've been sharing the stage with the Gary V. Yeah. I've been doing an event with Gary V. I've been sharing the stage with Les Brown. And that's actually you were when you were speaking at Gary V event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> there. I was there working like, behind the scene, making sure that everyone was okay. Uh, and I've been recently, this year has been a great year, I was uh, featured in the House of Parliament and mm. as one of the most influential migrant entrepreneurs of the year. So it's been a, it's been a, great, a great year and that's, and that's really about me, that's uh, what I do and that's what I'm passionate about doing. It is fabulous. So as I say, for those of you who are watching that don't know Simone Vincenzi, make sure you go and at least follow him or friend him on Facebook if he hasn't already maxed out. Go and check out GTEx, we're going to be putting the link on for GTEx a little bit later on today. So Simone, you're not going to, this is the League of Disruptors show, so anything really goes on this show. So feel free to absolutely let loose where you need to be. If you're passionate about something, you want to make a point, this is what the whole thing about this is. The program is been designed to spotlight your genius we'll be talking about didgeridoos we'll be talking about tedx we're going to be talking about so many things um i mean there's yeah. so many things in my agenda that i wonder but i want to start from before you 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 got off on on gtex and this whole event i mean your background and i was reading a little bit about your your background and stuff and obviously i've uh, heard you speak at different events and stuff is it is it true you were managing a michelin star restaurant at the age of 19 yes that's true i was the youngest michelin star restaurant manager in europe at the age of 19 and that happened when i was in italy but it started because uh, when i was 14 uh, unfortunately or fortunately <laughs> my parents split up and uh, my father was an alcoholic at the time now he's not anymore or a great job dad and um, my mom said no is enough is enough and they split up so at the age of 14 i started developing i was always very independent but i wanted to be even more independent 
And one of the way that I I was finding to escape that situation was uh, working. Mm. I also I hated school. I was like, what's the point of going to school? It's boring as hell, man. So <laughs> I was one of these, you know, these naughty boys in it that was always in the back row and was spending more time outside the door than inside the classroom, right? So <laughs> I was one of these kind of guys. And uh, I found that when I found my first job in a restaurant, because my mom was a friend and a friend, you know, a friend of a friend, friend of a friend, friend, yeah, of a friend yeah. that knows a, knows a friend, the uncle of the sister, the knows a friend. <laughs> and so I ended up working in this restaurant, and for the first time in my life, I did something I loved. I thought, I love this stuff. I love carrying plates and making other people happy. <laughs> it, it sounds cool to me. <laughs> right? And I loved it so much that I started working while I was going to school. Yeah. And, uh, and I developed this passion because I was doing scientific studies, right? Katana, I wasn't doing uh, um, uh, catering studies. Yeah. So I learned everything on the field and I was finding other waiters and other directors of restaurant chefs and I was asking them, how can I become good? I will walk, how can I do this? How can I, how can I serve the wine in this specific way? What do I say at that table? And uh, I've been working in more than, uh, oh man, I've been working in more than 300 restaurants in total. <laughs> 300 restaurants? <laughs> yes, because uh, I, instead of working on one single restaurant, I decided to be part of an agency and learn from different restaurants or different styles of service. So every, almost every night I was in a different place. Yeah. And I gained so much experience that at the age of 19, after five years, there was a Michelin star restaurant and uh, on the night, it was a very busy night, and the manager got fired mm. because uh, he wanted a pay rise and I said, okay, if you don't give me a pay rise, I'll leave the restaurant and the owner said, okay, you're fired. <laughs> so, it was like, uh, <laughs> but now we had a busy night and uh, I was just, I heard overheard a conversation and uh, I stepped in the room and I said, you know what, can you give me a go? Okay, can I just be the restaurant man? If it doesn't work, give me for a week. If it doesn't work, you hire another one. Otherwise, you give me that salary. And it was a really good salary. <laughs> for But here, for 19 year old, right? I think it was about 3,000 pounds, 3,000 euros a month. For wow. In 19, it, was, it was quite nice. That's a lot of money back then. That's a lot of money as well. So, oh, man, 19? <laughs> what, what do you have to do? Like, still live with your parents? Is that right? <laughs> And that was my journey in restaurant. That's why I came to London because then I've been recruited from uh, another restaurant I was working in to uh, to London to work in a, in another Michelin star restaurant, and and that was my previous background. Wow! <laughs> yeah, it was a lot, wow! A lot of I think it's amazing because um, most people, when they're probably nineteen, think about eating rather than managing a restaurant more than anything else. <laughs> you know, nineteen-year-old guys are just you know they're driven by their bellies rather than anything else. I mean, I can't remember I, what yeah. <laughs> I was. I was. I was probably yeah. I I wouldn't have ever sort of had that conscious state in my of my mind at that state at that age to have been been thinking about management there and I suppose the closest that I've ever got to something that which, which is regards to Michelin star restaurants is I went on MasterChef in 2009 that's about as close as I went to it did but, you yeah, yeah. What, what, what? I didn't know what are you doing there were you uh, yeah of course well no I, I was sure yeah I was I was uh, I went through the heats and and got onto the TV show in 2009 but this interview is not about me it's about you brother <laughs> no, when I, no, no. The question is: the reason why I ask you the question, when are you inviting me over for dinner? Then ah, oh, depends when. Uh, now, now, you, now I know this. I'm going to out invite myself. Oh, okay, well, right. well, well, I've got the Lave lovely Lavelda Smith on tomorrow, so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to check between the two of you, and yeah, we'll make that happen for sure. <laughs> so listen, um, guys, for all of you that are watching out there, there's loads of people that are tuning in. Harun Rabani's already just turned around and said two of my favorite entrepreneurs in one call. Woohoo! Janine Atadi, uh, there is Amar Shuds on it, Junior Oganyemi, Amanda Watts is on the house, Adrian, Neil, we're all in. Hey. Make sure you're getting Hi, make sure you're getting your questions in for uh Simone as you can. We're gonna be on for about an hour or so, so we'll be wrapping up by, by around about eight o'clock. So make sure you get some questions in for him. So look, 19 year old Michelin star restaurant manager, 3,000 euros a month. You're thinking, right, you know, you've gone through 300 restaurants through all of these processes. And now, it, now you're now you're in the UK. You're in the UK. Yes. What's next? What happened? 
What happened? I worked in this restaurant. And it was a great Michelin star restaurant in Notting Hill called Asagi. It was always been open for I think for about fifteen years. Uh -huh. uh, with the, all, all the all the celebrities were going dinner there. It was a very famous one. Uh -huh. Very small at the same time. I wasn't managing that restaurant. I was working as a waiter, as a head waiter there, but I loved it. And um, after two years, I was like, I got bored. I just got really bored because I've been working in restaurants since I was 14. So at yeah. the age of 22, I had already an eight year career. <laughs> Believe it or not. And it wasn't a light career. I was actually almost working every day, night and day, doing long shifts. And I, I was really good. And there was no more challenge for me. Mm. And I'm motivated by challenge. So what a better challenge to start in my own business. I all of a sudden, just, you know what, I'm bored, I've had enough of this, I've got an eight-year career already, I'm only 22, 22 eight-year-old career, but, but and, and, and that's it, you want to start a business. So, so what got you to, yeah. what got you to, um, to start with, I mean, was GTEx, is, is that the first startup that you've had, or did you try something else before that? No, I'm glad I've tried something else before, otherwise I would have failed GTEx. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad the first one because I remember I was I, I didn't know what to do and so I was going to this uh, personal I started going to personal development and going to the seminars yeah. to find myself yeah and I found I you know I would love to be that person on stage uh, it sounds pretty cool it sounds fun you get to help people uh, I've always been the kind of center of attention I never refused the spotlight yeah. And I would love to do the job. How do I go about that? Mm. So I signed up with the coaching academy and got a diploma in life coaching and youth coaching. And actually, you were the trainer of my first job. <laughs> as a youth, my first ever job as a coach. You bloody trained me, man. It's just like... It's <laughs> oh, dear me. Yes, yes. I still, I still remember. I still remember the ISBA model. The ISBA model that you trained me in. Like... <laughs> whoop, whoop, <laughs> <the Isma model. laughs> oh my god like, how how if, how if i'm where i am if i'm where i am is your fault i blame it on you man <laughs> uh, well i'll take that credit for where you're flying to my friend i'm telling you that that's awesome i can't believe that was your first coaching coaching gig and stuff yeah. that when that was ncs right when we did the uh, national citizens my first ever paid coaching gig i've ever had you didn't have a client yet first ever paid coaching me with young people there at the NCS and you were there training me and telling me the poor old bear story. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, oh yes, wow, wow, wow. My God, I didn't realize that that, that was the way. So, so you went through, you went through Future Foundations, you did, uh, you did all your bits and pieces through sort of the, the coaching side of, of the business and youth coaching and, and, and stuff like this. Tell me, um, you know, today we're all, you know, your business is all about helping others explode their uh, their businesses. I mean, in particular within yeah. sort of the coaching, you know, you guys are doing sort of untold or obscene amount of events and stuff like this. You know, what's, you know, how, I, I want you to really share with our audiences, you know, yes. the, the cusp of, I mean, um, when you when when you decided this is this is this is what I want to do. And what did you do to to get GTEx moving um, to, to become the, yeah, the well, juggernaut I is today. That, I think that we got to start from uh, the first business I started yeah. when you asked me was <coughs> GTEx the first business and yeah. no it's not. The first was the super cheesy Your Power to Shine which was way more cheesy than GTEx as a name of a business and uh, I was helping people finding their purpose in life and it's something I'm really passionate to. One of my biggest topic is purpose because I believe that everyone has a purpose and when we don't live our purpose then we are unhappy and we are not fulfilling our full potential. Yeah. So I was helping people finding that clarity and that alignment within themselves. But I didn't have a bloody clue of how to run that as a business. I was a brilliant coach, but I didn't have a bloody clue how to run that as a business. So after about a year, I ended up living on the street for six months. Oh. And that has been a big learning experience because I didn't have money in my bank account. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's cold sleeping on the street. <laughs> and I tell you, in particular, if you sleep from October to March, is freaking cold yeah. and i remember being uh, one night i was uh, while i was sleeping on the street and i had this kind of conversation with myself you know you have these moments when you have to look at yourself in the mirror yeah and say no simone there is something that must change right now otherwise 
all this coaching all your life, that ain't gonna happen. So I went back into a part-time job because I could always find a job as a waiter. It was almost like a personal challenge. I could, with my career, I could always go back into, into employment. Mm. So I went back, I found a job in another restaurant and I decided to really start understanding how does this bloody industry work? Because it's not just general business, the speaking and coaching industry is a very specific industry. Mm. So how can I start my business? How can I run my business in the most effective way? And how can I deliver while I'm doing that the most effective amount of value to my client? I don't know if that makes sense. Absolutely. I think I think for what you're talking about there, and I think that's, you know, <clears throat> Uh, rule 101 you know you you've gone in you've started to observe and what's interesting yeah. is you've gone in you're not observing oh what's going on it's more of a how can i do you know what i want to do in the industry that i want to do it in effectively that's the bit that i think is really really important it's not just yes. about doing it like someone else is doing it so it's amazing that you're kind of Okay, yeah, every, we all have this kind of moment where we have to listen to our inner selves and like you say, you, you, you've got to ask yourself tough questions, especially when you're in a tough environment. I mean, having to go from, you know, 3,000 euros a, a month to actually living living sort of on the streets is a tough grind because you're probably sometimes reflecting back and saying, what if I just stayed where I was? I wouldn't be in these kind of positions. But yeah. unlike thinking backwards, you just kept looking forward. Um, yeah, that's that's really that's really what got me moving because uh, and also it was a very personal challenge even when I was homeless uh, it, I, it sounds weird but I was homeless for choice because I didn't want to go back in, in employment and I wanted to make it all on my own and I had all this thing that was also my own my limited thing that I had to do everything by myself now is and that that's what was holding me back but is that determination or is that stubbornness Simone come on be honest I think, you? <laughs> I think there is there is a fine line mm. because sometimes the determination can become stubbornness mm -hmm. sometimes the determination can become so strong that actually you lose sight of the full picture because then I was like okay then when I woke up I was like I can struggle and be homeless and grind all that I want to but who the heck is going to hire a homeless coach <laughs> If, if you think about that, it, it, but, but because my, I'm, I'm determined, I, if I want something, I get it. That's my. That's how I am. If I want something, I get it. I don't. It doesn't matter how long it takes, but how I get it has been like always, like to struggle and doing everything by myself. And then I realize, you know what? That's enough. Why don't I get someone to help me? So in the past. Uh, five years now we've been spending between uh, like me and my business partner Ben for our personal and business development we've been spending almost around 120,000 pounds just in courses learning how to sell learning how to market learning how to speak <laughs> these are all skills that we needed to learn and because of that uh, it didn't pay off immediately but uh, along the way over the years it all paid and more <laughs> Well, look, that's the next, <clears throat> I think that's the next important lesson that I really want to kind of pull out of this. I mean, the fact that, well, there's two lessons there, actually. The first one was you got to a stage with your determination and borderline stubbornness about not going back and not getting into a job and, and, yes. and starting your own thing. That's your drive forward. You've been intuitive in the fact that you're looking at the industry that you uh, you want to get into and not looking at how people are doing it but how you could be more effective in that industry which is how can i be even better than them exactly better. exactly yeah. so you know you're not coming and saying oh they can do that so surely i can it was very much of i i can do this better than you or it's more of a case of what do i need to do to make this better than you yes. and at that yes. point you kind of get to the stage where you kind of <clears throat> where you've maximized out all of your potential all of everything that you can do and, 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 you know, it's nature and, and, and its own entity that says to you, right, there are gaps here which need to be filled, which is where Ben comes in, for example, your partner, yes. you know, your business partner comes in and, you know, how you find your business partner. Um, I'll ask you, uh, you on, on how you found Ben uh, in, in, in a second. But really, from my from my perspective, I normally view that if you understand the gaps that you have in your business and the type of things that you need to bring in in terms of resource and skill, that's what helps you kind of almost interview where yes. you're going to get your partner from. What's interesting from here, um, and we'll touch base on this a little bit more in a second, is 
then you guys made a decision to invest in yourselves not a we've got an idea let's go it was right we need to we need to learn how to speak we need to learn how to build the programs we need to learn how, all of this kind of stuff i find that there's a lot of people that have are motivated there and um, and inspired by people like yourself who they see you doing what you're doing and they think you know this is the kind of thing i want to do because you're making such a an impact on people you're changing their lives you're having fun you're 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 always doing those cheeky selfies with your pout that you do you know signature moves for you but then you see the the facade people see and, and then they think right they can do this the same thing and whilst i encourage people to to take that you know step forward not a leap the step forward and make that decision to start their stuff people aren't ready to invest in themselves to make it happen they think it's ready to go on a plate so before we go into sort of investment how did you how did you meet ben how did that work with Ben is a really interesting because that's also about uh, if on a business perspective that was a big naivety for us to get together because me and Ben the great thing is that we are similar the bad thing is that we are similar <laughs> <laughs> what do I mean about that it is because we get each other we have the same personality same characters same strength so we get each other. Mm. On the other side, we have also the same blind spots. Okay. So our business actually, I think uh, that if we were different, could have grown at a different, even even bigger. Mm. As been when also now we are getting people in a strategic way. We say, okay, what are the, what is that we don't have? But at the time, it was even a business. It was fun. It was in game. We were like two like snowballs. <laughs> they were going everywhere. It's like yeah, okay. Like, have you ever seen the, the movie Flubber with Robbie Williams? Yeah, Robbie Williams? yeah, yeah. The, the green thing, the green ball that was going everywhere. We were two green balls going everywhere, and everyone knew us. And we we're going always at the same events. And I remember. One time I got um, a room, I just came out from a course from uh, with my trainer, yeah. Clinton Swain, yeah. and it was a course on negotiation. Mm. And something that I'm doing, as I always do, is as soon as I learn something, I apply it. But that's something, learn it and apply it, learn it and apply it, learn it and apply it. And uh, I went out, I, I said I wanted to find a room for my events for free. I'm going to negotiate the hell out of it. And I want to start my own event, and I never done an event before, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to find a room for free. Yeah. And uh, I negotiated a room for seven events for free. I was like, wow. Seven. Got, Not I one. Seven events. Seven events. No, I got I got, I got a con with seven events for free. It was, it was in an organic farm. Like there were pigs around. There was smelling of shit. There were doing it. It was this room called the straw bale room because actually it was made by two straw bale. So it was. <laughs> That's how GDX started. But, hey, yo, we had, the, we had the room. We could run an event. We had somewhere we could get people in. And I still remember, I, I picked up the phone and I said, the first number I called was Ben. I said, Ben, what can we do? <laughs> and it's been it's been really the Steve Jobs story where we went in, we met the day after in my room we spent about 48 hours <laughs> in my room <laughs> and we put 100 pound each I had 100 pound he had 100 pound say okay let's start this thing in 48 hours we had a website we had the logo we had the leaflets we had our first three events published on Eventbrite <laughs> it was like what all right all right slow down here a second okay. so okay. so let me get this straight okay you came out of a negotiating event where you'd learned how to negotiate and you just went out and negotiated or tried to negotiate at that time an event space you actually ended yes. up nego negotiating seven and then you thought yeah. hold on a second what are we going to do as an event now and and then you actually reverse engineered and filled it within 48 hours yep. with all the events that you did. So actually, rather than doing what most conventional people do is build an event, plan it, structure it, and then go and find a venue, you flipped it the other way around. And you actually, yeah. you, you you found the event, in, uh, you found the event space and you thought, great, now let's put something in there. <laughs> Sadly. Well, I, I mean, I, 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 what, what, take us through what you, what was going through your head and your heart as you run up to those events because most people have this whole i mean i've i've i'm not someone that does a lot of events but uh, i did one one quite big one in 2012 uh in earl's court and that almost killed me in terms of planning that event but uh, so that's why i thought to myself 
that kind of life ain't for me. I think I'll leave it to the GTEx guys over here to, to do those kind of <laughs> things, basically. But uh, but tell me, just run me through the highs and lows of once you got you got the farm, you've got the venue, you've got your flies, you've got your Eventbrite, everything's done. 48 hours, you're now running up towards this event. What's going through your mind? I mean, did you have these bits of paranoia and anxiety that no one's going to turn up and stuff? What what was going through? Well, I, I, we actually kind of expected that no one was going, to, was going to turn up because the reality is that no one knew us. So we were part of different communities. We were going to, we've been going around events for about two, three years. Yeah. And we were always the kind of people that were taking the microphone. So. People have seen us around, never on the stage, but always in the audience. But we didn't have people that were following us. Like ah. we were still like two young kids. There were two 24-year-old coaches that uh, wanted to change the person development industry that we didn't have any bloody clue what we wanted. <laughs> so uh, what we did, uh, remember the first event, there was, um, oh my God, there were two dear friend of mine. It was one of my uh, mentor in the youth coaching arena, which is Steve Beko Yeah, I know Steve. I know Steve. Yeah. Steve, yeah. The so speaker has been our first. Uh, it was been our first speaker there, and then I think we had uh, we had someone else as I speak. I don't remember who it was. Uh, <laughs> at the, oh, Eli. Eli was my coach. It was my coach at the time. Then she came and spoke. Yeah. I know Eli as well. <laughs> Okay, perfect, right? So they opened Ritter, they were the, the, the column of Jeep, they opened it up. And at that event, they were, in the audience, they were me, Ben, his father, uh, Ila's husband, and uh, another poor soul that I think he bought it, a six pound ticket. <laughs> 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 Literally, th there was a cafe beside the room. We were actually going in the cafe and talking to me. Wait, by the way, we're running an event here. It's six quid the ticket. Do you want to come anyway? Love <laughs> yeah, it. For Love it. Well, that, that's <laughs> the hustle, isn't it? At the end of the day, look, you, you know, I think what I'm trying to get to is people plan too much and don't execute enough. And as I yeah. say, from what I'm hearing here is you, you very much are actually. I don't know if it was done intentionally. It was just the very nature of the the way you approach this. You thought, okay, we've we've got this far. We've done the you know we've got the event space. We've got the we've got the fly and everything. We just haven't got yes. people here. So you just you know you thought quite simply, we just need to go out and get people. You know. Um, yeah, and that's and that's me. That's my nature because I know everyone is motivated by different things. You know that people are motivated either because they, as our dear friend Tony Robbins says. Yeah. Raise your hand, say hi, right? And as our dear friend Tony says, uh, people are moved either to move away from pain or move towards pleasure. Now, I am massively moving away from pain. Like, I'm not motivated by pleasure at all. Mm. I'm motivated mainly by pain. Mm. So, what happens, I know this, so I create pain around me, so then I know that the more pain I have around me, the, the more I go. So, the more, so the fact of having that. I say I have it, so I cannot go through the pain of not doing anything with this. So then I move myself forward, and that has been always me. Now, my fiance can argue with that and say sometimes that you got to plan a bit more because otherwise you make a silly decision. But <laughs> that is, is my nature. I put myself in a situation and then I figure it out along the way because I don't want to stay. And to fail i hate failing but, i hate failing and uh, i'm going to come to some of those points in a second i just want to co uh, just quickly get some shout outs going in here i've got cami beddies in there roy smooth's in the house beiju's here hey, <laughs> herman stewart saying keep up the good work guys uh, i'm looking forward he's coming he's herman stewart's coming on soon harun ravani stubbornness and determination are precisely the characteristics for a real entrepreneur the challenge is to know the fine line between the two great discussion guys loving it Ashes Roger, Manny Wolf's in from the L from LA, Manny's on, Bob Singer's in the house, wow, James Porritt's on, James is going to be on later on today, and Marcus Dogger. I, guys, if you've got any questions for Simone, please, 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 please get those over to us on the, on the, um, on the feed and I'll ask Simone for you. We just got to the stage of Simone's journey where he's actually gone from being a Michelin star restaurant manager to homeless to uh, thinking who the hell would hire a homeless coach. To deciding to uh, book a farm venue to do some events and actually not knowing what events he wanted to do to actually just saying right we're just going to drag a whole load of people together and keep moving 
Now let's fast forward. You know, you talked a little bit about Phelan, okay? I, I, the way I kind of, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of digesting what you're saying to me here is where you put pain into your environment so it drives you and pushes you to, to keep moving yes. forward, allows you to kind of focus that determination you have. The, you know, um, fail, failure is, you know, I, I, I get the sense that for you, failure isn't something which is the be all and end all. It's just something that you understand and accept is going to become part and parcel of the process that you're undertaking. And it's really a case of, um, where your expectations are and where your deliveries are. So tell me, so give us give us an example of where you did something and you believed it, in your opinion, it failed miserably. And how how, how did you sort of move on from that? Oh, yeah, definitely. I've got great examples of it. Got, I kind of, I don't know where to pick them from. <laughs> so many. Now, when we're talking about failure, I think that everyone has their own definition. Yeah. And for me, failure is not doing anything about something. I feel I've failed if I'm if I haven't even give it a go. If I don't give it a go, I failed. That's that's my definition of failure. Mm. So when I'm looking at uh, getting results and doing something, I know that now that is a process of adjusting, and I'm and I'm content with that. I know that uh, th the first time probably is going to suck, and the second time is going to suck even worse, and the third time I might get it right. And then the fourth time uh, is nice, and from the fifth time onwards, then I might do something right. Uh... And then after the tenth time, that's nice, that's sweet, I can do it. So uh, that's my that's my framework right now, because I, I mean, I've coached now hundreds of people, and I've been through, and I took a lot of, I'm an action taker, so I took a lot of action. I got myself into different businesses. I got myself into the event business, and. The first time I've seen a lot of people running their events and the first time, yes, it sucked. It sucked and get comfortable with that because you're going to completely blow up. Just And if you are great, you're... I don't know what to say. That, that's just... It's luck, probably, or because you are naturally great. But for everyone else, just know that you're going to suck and this is going to be fine and you're not going to die. So so what you've, so, what you've done there, so, uh, sorry to run so really what you've done is you've laid your expectations in very, very early rather yes. than kind of looking at that final glory, which is, you know, the neon blue lights and hundreds of thousands of people there and everyone's chanting your name and, you know, you've got the everything going. It's kind of a look, do you know what? Um, I have I have great expectations for my for my event, but I I probably it's the first time I'm doing it, so it's probably going to suck. See, what you've done is yes. you've tempered your expectation down a little bit, so it doesn't look like failure because you think to yourself, okay, well we didn't get to a hundred, but we got to twenty. Twenty is better than nothing, and then you're kind of yeah. you, you've got something to build on from that. I think that's a really important trait here. Uh, you never, no one's ever going to get it right the first time, and you're absolutely right. If they do get it right, maybe it's the right time, right place, right thing, but it's not going to be sustainable. It's not going to be. You can't replicate that. That that exactly. And, and as much as it's annoying, because I am extremely competitive, I hate to lose. Like I, I don't think you know that people say, "Oh, the most important thing is to participate." No, screw that. I want to win, <laughs> right? <laughs> like that's. I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I was at the award ceremony, and uh, it, I wanted I wanted them to pick my bloody name. <laughs> And it's, I hate to lose. And I remember I was doing a speak. Oh, this one was fine. I was having a speaking competition. Uh, it was you know the Mintel speaking challenge mm -hmm. organized by the College of Public Speaking. Yeah. And me and Lovelda were participating, and we were in the same round. Now Lovelda passed to the final, and I didn't. Now the fact is that I've practiced my six-minute talk. I think about a uh, hundred times for six minutes just to make sure that everything was on point. Every move was on point. Tone, everything was on point of my talk. She wait. She wrote the speech the morning before the. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, no, she's not gonna win. Like, <laughs> we need the bloody the bloody competition. She passed. I did it. <laughs> I had this cringe here for about three days. I couldn't. I couldn't look at her. She was like, "Baby, are you okay?" It's like, D -d 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 "Don't talk to me." Okay. And then he passes on. And <laughs> so, what are you, what are you trying to say? Of... You can. There's practice makes perfect, but then there's over practicing that just kills you completely. Is that is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, it does. But also, it's about how are you? Do you? I think that people that are the best. Uh, are the best because they want to be the best. 
mm-hmm. and if they if they they feel no disappointment if they don't perform in the way they could perform or if they don't give the best of themselves then they're never going to be the best mm. if i know i can do something better i always feel this a bit of disappointment that's brilliant that's such and brilliant I, advice i feel disappointment a lot of times because it's almost every day that i know i could do something better so it's not just about i'm living a miserable life and i'm disappointed all the time it's not that i'm a, a depressed black sheep but <laughs> I, I i'm i'm pretty cool i'm happy but i'm saying okay how can i be better and if i don't win uh, it takes me a couple of days to just get myself together again <laughs> That's, so, that's that's the Italian in you, you're too passionate about that's it. The that's the Italian. When you were talking about failure before, I remember I was, um, it was one of my biggest events that I did at the beginning. Yeah. We had, I think, about 80 people in the room. And um, I, I was selling. And all the people were there because they wanted to learn their purpose. I had my program ready. And it was one of the first times I was selling from the stage. So people were always telling me I was a great speaker, but I was... I wasn't great at sales, selling from the stage which I started and mm. you mean you sold for success resources and Tony Robbins, you know that selling and speaking from the stage they are two different things. Yes. You can be a great speaker but suck at closing, you can be a rubbish speaker and be awesome at closing. Yeah. So I didn't have that skill yet, so I remember eighty people. I did my pitch. Man, I watched the video of my pitch. I didn't want to buy from myself. <laughs> What? Even myself, I wouldn't have bought that program and I created that bloody program, it was good, the program was good, but the pitch was sucked so <laughs> brutally that I, I, would have, I would have not bought for myself, I would actually ask for the refund for the ticket just for the ticket. <laughs> and I only had one person over 80 people that bought. Okay. And it wasn't an expensive thing, it was about a 47 pound program, right. Right? so I'm not talking about going to the t- hundreds of thousands. 47 quid, one person gave me 47 quid, and I think they did it because they, they felt pity uh, of saying, you just give 47 quid for this poor guy here on stage that is mumbling a couple of things together. <clears throat> so that that was one of my biggest failures, but I turned it around, and now I'm one of the people in terms of percentages that close the most in, in our industry, and I teach other people how to do that. That's, so, that's amazing, and look, do you know some tips for people uh, you know out there who I mean, I'm not a traditional self from stage kind of guy myself. I like, I, I prefer to um, show the value, give as much as I can and let people make their decisions based on my expertise or my, you know, yes. the workability. A lot of the time I get people that come to me and say, I think you're the right person for me. And when I have that said to me, I almost feel like I've done my job right. You know, it's no, you know, I'm not impulsed by saying, right, go to the back of the room, you've got 20 minutes to buy, blah, blah, blah. I just can't do it because I have this kind of thing about me that if I've got someone in front of me that can't afford or is not really good for me or right for me, I shouldn't be having them in my, you know, in my process. Um, But you got to that stage, $47, you know, £47 um, sale of, of, you know, of this whole thing, presentation sucked. One thing that you said when you were talking about that failure thing is you watched your video back and you said, I wouldn't buy from myself. How how much of that that, that process is important for people to do that they should really recognize what it is that they're pitching out to people and and believe that would I buy this myself and what's the reason why without the biases of, of it's me of course I'd buy it it's more the reality how important has that factor played in you getting to where you are today where you're probably one of the highest converters um, you know from stage well I think that the, cr- the the crucial thing is confidence and being there are few there are few steps okay that's the good some some steps yeah. First of all, is confidence because uh, there is the reality is that if you are not confident, you are not inspiring people. In uh, you're not inspiring leadership. Mm. Now, when people buy psychologically, they buy because uh, they believe that you are going to lead them somewhere, somewhere where they are not. They, they haven't arrived yet by themselves. Right. So, if you are not confident in uh, expressing in the whole process, and I'm talking from the moment that you step on stage up until the moment you make the close then there is no congruency because people are saying hmm do I really want to spend money with this person that doesn't really believe in themselves and you might believe in yourself but maybe your speaking skills are not there yet to to give that to project that confidence okay so that must be the first thing where you work work on your stage presence stage presence but then that involves confidence and belief yeah 
Yeah. Okay. Confidence and belief. And then the second part is uh, creating a, a great product because personally, I hate selling from the stage the way a lot of people sell. And I hate buying from the stage the way a lot of people sell. The, when I, you know, the hard sales go at the back of the room. Mm. I never do that. Yeah. Never, I did it once and I hated it doing it. Yeah. So I know I can do it because you have a script, you know what to say, blah, blah, blah. You're confident, you're a good speaker, people buy. You have a good product, people buy. But I hate it that way. So the other part is actually having a product that is a no-brainer. And I think that what made us very successful is that instead of selling, going to how much money can I make with the least effort, what exp that's where a lot of the industry is going. You know, everything is automated. Mm -hmm. uh, just you have the seven dollars program, and then a forty-seven dollar program, and then a hundred forty-seven dollar program, and then two hundred forty-seven, and blah 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 blah. But for me, it was uh, how can I actually create an experience for my client where? If they don't get there over a period of time, if they don't get the results they want, it just means they have not taken action. Yeah. But my focus is how can I create a product which is not only a product, it's actually a support environment for them and gives them everything they need yeah. in order to achieve the goal that they want so to achieve in their business. So you pretty much package everything out. The value package yes. is the, the most and fundamentally important part there. That's phenomenal. <clears throat> I just want to take, there's some questions that have come through. I just want to take one question here while, while we're on this conversation. Haroon, Haroon, Haroon Rabani's question. Hey Haroon, <laughs> how you doing buddy? Question for, her, uh, for Simone. Where the heck do you find the energy to work as hard and consistently as you do? How much downtime do you take? Good point. Where do I find my energy? Drugs and alcohol? No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> disruptor <laughs> is the disruptor. <laughs> where, do I, where do I find my energy? Um, I've always had a lot of energy. I always said it. It's just part of me. Thank you, God. Uh, one of my gifts. So, no social, no special recipe, no green smoothie. I mean, I have an healthy diet. I'm vegan. Maybe that helps. I don't know. I had a lot of energy when I wasn't vegan, so I don't know. <laughs> But the, the fact, I think, is that part is my personality. I always had a lot of energy. And if I find something that I love, nothing can stop me. Mm. Regarding the downtime, that's the other side. I actually need to consciously, a lot of people need to consciously, you know, put the effort in for work. That's a natural for me. My effort is actually my difficult thing is to find downtime for my life. Mm. And to create a fine, to create a downtime for my life. Because... Um, I, if I find something, I just put it in the calendar and then I realize, oh, wow, I actually don't have any time left for myself. And it's still something is an ongoing process and uh, my fiance is working very hard <laughs> on me with that to make sure that actually we can see each other. And <laughs> so that that's my struggle at the moment. Uh, um, and there's something that I know is something that uh, I, I'm working on and I'm putting uh, something that I did, for example, I'm not putting any meetings before 12 o'clock. Okay. So generally, the mornings are for me. Good. So, so I think I think it's fair to say at some point within you know the last year or two, while you've been well, the last couple of years that you've been grinding and getting getting out and doing all this stuff and booking everything and every hour that comes, sometimes you find <clears throat> I don't know if if you've had this, but I've had these experiences before where sometimes you find a bit of solace or downtime in between what you're doing because like you say naturally when you love and you have a passion and an interest for something yes. it doesn't necessarily feel like you're, app you're applying although the energy is there and sometimes you kind of can you can switch your mind off for a little while even though you're working on auto mode if that makes sense um, but the other yes. side of it is is <clears throat> I get the sense that Simone, you're an you're an individual that's actually draws energy from others as well so you know yes. you get a you, you know now, this is why I guess you're in the industry and in the environment and in the sector that you're you're in whether it's kind of the events and working with businesses to help them grow and explode their coaching businesses and stuff like this where yes. where you feed off very much the the energy of others when you can see them growing it's almost like you've someone's just kicked up a a very recharged Duracell battery up your bum basically and away you, exactly. you, away you go <laughs> do you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
yeah, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I get this one. So when I have sensational coaching calls, like when I have my, when I do my accountability rock calls with my clients, or when I'm doing a strategy or an insight call, and it's just been, it's just bit after bit after bit. I mean, I just had this just now. I just finished a call just before coming online with you with one of my clients from Guatemala, and we just had such a, a solid hour. I felt. I felt like almost it's like 8.30 in the morning again and I'm bouncing around and I haven't even had a cup of coffee kind of thing. So sometimes I think yeah. the energy you draw and maintain is really from the clients that you work with as well. Is that is that true to say? It's definitely true. It's definitely true. The more people I'm around, then the, the, the more energy I have. But it's almost like, um, it's really interesting because use the example of a battery, it's almost like a, I'm getting in overload. <laughs> like the more people, I go to an event, a lot of people, then I'm getting <laughs> buzzing. I remember I was, uh, I was, uh, I'm seeing Les Brown and there were 800 people that were screaming, they were shouting, I was getting them dancing and we getting them red. <laughs> Les Brown, I was having the time of my life. I was nervous as a wreck the moment I was stepping, the moment before I was stepping on the stage. I was, you know, I was shaking. I was, I didn't sleep that night. All the things could imagine. So, you know, I was like, I'm freaking hosting Les Brown event, <laughs> and so I went, I went out. As soon as I stepped on the stage, I look around. I got people. No more nerves. Yeah. Why? Because th that's my element, and I think that a lot of people they are actually doing. They don't know themselves enough, and they just look at other people, and they they want to have their success, but they don't realize is that really your element. Is it really what makes you happy? Is it really where you give the most? Yeah. And then I found also now that I do so many events, I need also more downtime. So a lot of mornings, I actually start working after 12 That's good. or maybe like 11 o'clock in the morning. I just send my email at nine o'clock to my mailing list every day. And then I you can't I'm switching just, off. Yeah. Or no, that's brilliant. Because <clears throat> I'm working a lot of evenings, so I'm having a lot of events in the evening, so I know that up until 12 o'clock, sometimes 1 o'clock, I'm out because um, I'm speaking at times I come back home. So. Well, I, I think it's interesting because I, 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 I spoke to Amanda Watts about this and I've also recently interviewed Brad Burton and there's one thing that uh, is coming in common yes. here, which is you don't have to work 9 to 5, you don't have to work the, the hours, it's actually building and working when you feel you're most productive rather and then yes. actually providing your downtime when you feel like you're kind of broken down the fact that you're adding you know time on in the mornings to, to, to allow you to sort of come back to earth and come back down because for those of you who perhaps don't do public speaking or, or engage in terms of an audience thing it's not as easy as just getting up on stage and giving a half an hour talk um, it's actually yeah. very energy sapping I, I mean I'll give you an example <clears throat> this year I went to Brazil um, and I had to, I, I had a five an audience of five thousand young entrepreneurs from all over the world. Wow! It was it was energy it was energizing just getting on stage before anyone came in. Now imagine this, Simone, in less than a minute and a minute and a half, five thousand people are congregating and sat down in in the room ready for me. <laughs> So I was wow. buzzing because I did the video and I'm like, watch this in less than two minutes, 5,000 people were going to be in this room and literally just like steam poured in, sat down. Wow. Then the chanting starts and then I come on and when I finished, I did this whole little piece uh, where I got them, I did a video selfie and I got them to all shout like yes. Juju's got talent and shout and cry. When I came off stage behind the scenes, I, mean, I got all the high fives and everything going, I had to sit down. I was literally floppy i just i had no energy left in me at all <laughs> Do you know well, if you think about that if you think about that katana you gave your energy to five thousand people that morning so imagine that sometimes you have a conversation people have a conversation one-to-one -one, that you had a conversation at the same time with five thousand people is is normal having this down the moment with a huh yeah, because you're running on adrenaline there. You have there such a pump of adrenaline yeah. in your body running all the time, while you are getting there to make sure that your energy goes out yeah. literally to five thousand people. And when you're doing it, it's fine. But then when you're finishing, it's like, oh. <laughs> anyway, I just finished the weekend training. We are doing a training called on the stage for some of our clients, mm. teaching them. Uh, public speaking, uh, facilitation, uh, speaking on camera, and all these kind of cool things. And uh, at the end of the week, during the weekend, great energy, and then I actually, during after, in the evening, I went to collect my award, and then I came... I saw that, yeah. The, 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 so 
So it, it was a great, great weekend. As soon as people left the room, and yesterday night, took, put an episode of Friends, my brain switched off, <laughs> and I was the happiest person in the world. <laughs> love it, love Friends, it. Lichens, lichens and vampires, I'm quite passionate about Netflix and stories of lichens and vampires, they get to switch my brain off, and it works. Anything, anything for a little bit of escapism, that's what I, I say, There's that, that, you know, everyone's got their sort of guilty pleasure and then that, you know. Yeah, any, anything legal. Anything legal. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's the Disruptor Show, mate, you know, you can say whatever you want. Uh, let me take some comments from the audiences there. Catherine Monaghan's talking about added value and experimentals. Um, Haroon was just laughing. Um, Catherine Monaghan's also talking about your passion. Um, Haroon was giving you respect for being honest about your downtime. Um, Janine um, Aristide is on. She said, a question for Simone. Lavelle does a great speaker too. So how do you work together? Um, I'm going to see if there's more. Or are you competing against each other? Ooh. Good question, good question, Jan Jan uh, Janine. Jan okay, Janine. Oh, great question. Thank you very much. You know what? At the beginning, we were we weren't actually working together because we said relationship and business separate. I mean, it was more of a her decision than my decision. I want to work together. I think it was cool. She said, no, 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 business on one side, relationship on the other side. <laughs> and as a good man, what you say is that okay. <laughs> As a, as a good man <laughs> it's the typical thing they say do you know what <laughs> having arguments uh with women um is like reading the terms and conditions on an iphone basically you just go to the bottom and say i agree it was a good one i got i got to use this shot. I, I like it no, no. now what we're doing actually because we we speak on different topics so there is no competition the things that we do together is the MC. Mm. So when we do MC, Beth, she's a great MC. I'm a great MC. So what happens actually was really funny. We had an email from a company called the Word Disrupt Forum, and they're doing events with the biggest startup company. I mean, they had the founder of Spotify. Uh, did you know that? Yeah. No, I remember you, you said that. So, uh, so well, you tagged me and said, "Next year you got to get to this event." Oh yeah, exactly. You got to speak there next year because it's a great event for you. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, we received on the same day the same email for them that for this company that was looking for an MC for their events and they found both of us on LinkedIn so what we said when we called them we, we had a chat before and we said shall we just apply separately or shall we do something together and that was the first time and then we did MC together then we had another event with uh, where we hosted an event that was featuring Simon Seneca John C Maxwell she got she was contacted and she asked me do you want to be part of that event because she knew how much that would have meant to me connecting with doing an event where those two people were featured yeah and then i said yeah so now it's becoming more a collaboration we don't look at that a competition we size the opportunity and then we are looking at our relationship as a team okay. and then how can we be a good team then of course uh, sometimes uh, my competitive side is just oh I'm gonna get it, <laughs> but I'm like no oh, relationship is more important. It's like you found the woman of your life, don't screw it up for your ego. It's like slow down. Well, <laughs> so, we'll see about that, young man, because I've got actually tune in, guys. Tomorrow evening I have the lovely Lavelda Smith on, so I decided <laughs> I decided to have Simone on Monday and his better half on Tuesday. Look how look how genius I am at this. So you can. <laughs> <laughs> I bet yeah. you were going to get a different side to that story in a sec. So yeah, of course. <laughs> we've got the real version. We've got about four or five minutes left. I've, there's so much that I want to talk. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I had a pass. It's already one I know. It's already been an hour almost. Um, so Haroon saying, being a superhero requires nuclear charged energy. Of course, you're going to be shattered, bro. Um, Janine is actually laughing after what we just talked about. So is Catherine Monaghan. She's saying, oh man, Haroon's come back in. Is your relationship better as a result of you working with Lavelda in business? Interesting. Um, I don't think it changed. No, the, I didn't find any particular difference. Yeah. Because uh, we always, even if we do, weren't officially doing business together, she has a business, I have a business, two entrepreneurs are living under the same roof. Yeah. You get to talk about each other. You get to we, we help each other a lot. 
and in particular she's very structured and I'm idea generator and creator so every time uh, I now I have an idea I'm like okay baby what do you think about it so we've constantly been helping each other that's actually interesting so that that's really interesting sorry to cut in there uh, very quickly because you know yeah. when you talked about your relationship with Ben and in terms of your partnership you've got two of the same guys yeah. you understand each other and sometimes it's good that you know you have that balance and it's bad that you have that balance what you've actually just described there quite quickly I'm not saying that you guys are going to get into partnership for business but you've now got a breakout yeah. you've got someone who can add structure to your madness and you've exactly. got uh, you've got the flexibility and the the insanity that goes into the to help the elder with her struck you know with her structure kind of exactly to her getting more out there and uh, together more talking about sales and marketing which is uh, not the stronger suit but she's great in organizing and looking at the, all those more details she's awesome at it so we com we complement each other very well so right now um, the relationship uh, we, uh, what we need to do which is uh, what we actually forced ourselves to do because at the beginning it just became about business we're just talking about business and the relationship was like uh, then we say how can we actually be with each other without talking about business so now we have date nights and uh, if, if, if once a week we have a, a night where it's no business do, it's just do, us do and you schedule it in the calendar do you schedule it in the calendar yeah yeah oh. <laughs> remember what doesn't get scheduled? What doesn't get scheduled? Doesn't get done. Doesn't get done. <laughs> right? And I, oh, and I remember my ex, my, my ex girlfriend. She got so pissed off because I was scheduling her in her calendar. <laughs> and I'm like, if you want me to see you, so when like, I got to do this, and when I met with Lovelda and she put me in the calendar, I knew that I was the right oh, man for her. Oh, I'm like, when the first time I met Lovelda, she put, let me put you in my calendar. I'm like, oh my god, I love you. <laughs> I, I love you already. <laughs> Because it was such a pain with the other one before, and it's like I put you in my calendar. Oh, why do you have to put me in the calendar? I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> oh my god! Oh. So listen, guys, um, it's it's we're 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 out of time. We're out of time. <laughs> uh, do you know? I can't believe it. So listen, um, I I just just some top tips for um for our audiences on uh, what they need to do to build an explosive business what what would you say what was your top five tips that that you would give to to anyone out there that's trying to build an explosive business i'll give you i'll give you the top three tips oh I like it one first one is uh, become create a great product so great product that almost sell itself so don't be shy in terms of giving, giving, giving the others much value as possible and think about what does my audience need and give it to them. Like exactly what they need and even more that they're not even expecting. Don't be afraid to give it to them even for a lower price. At the beginning, don't focus on the price, focus on building a community. Okay. So get a lot of people joining you, joining you, joining you and serve them, serve them, serve them. Then they will become your biggest advocate and you will have the credibility of hundreds of people have been working with you. Mm. Then after you create a great product, then focus on the marketing on the product. So at the beginning, a lot of people say, I want to build a brand. I'm like, yeah, brand doesn't make you money. What makes you money is marketing and sales. So the tip number two is marketing. Learn marketing. Get yourself out there as many times as possible. That's why I still I do 200 events a year. And I tell all my clients to as many events as possible. Even if it's three, four people that are in an audience, I'm going to be there as a speaker at the moment. Mm. Why? Because the bigger the exposure, the better it is. Then there's going to be a point where I will cut down, but not right now. And then focus on sale, which is the tip number three. Make sure that you become great at selling, whether it's one-to-one, -one, whether you're doing seminar, you're selling from stage, make sure you learn that because otherwise you will have a lot of people, but no money. And Katan, you know that there are a lot of speakers that in this industry, mm. they have huge followings, but they don't make any money. Mm. So you don't need to have a huge following. You can have a good following, a nice following, even like 10 people, but of these 10 people, seven buy, you're better off than the person that have a hundred people that are following and two yeah. buy. No, absolutely. I, I, I concur for that. So just to, just to repeat out there, guys, you know, 
build a product of you know immense value package it all together you know focus on building a community get these people to add you know serve them this is what Simone is telling you serve that community because they become your advocates they become your fans rather than your customers yes. you know then it's not about your brand it's about your marketing if you don't get the message out there then people won't understand who you are why you're there what you're doing and what you can do for them and then yeah. don't forget the most important, just because you've built a great product and you've got a great following, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get the conversions you need to make sure that you know how to sell that product and convert that from a lead or an yeah. inquiry into a proper sale. Because until they put that money in your bank account, they're not really a customer of yours. So, I mean, those are three phenomenal points. One last thing, Mr. Vincenzi, because I know you're a very busy man and you need to go and get some downtime or you've got to blast that didgeridoo of yours basically um <laughs> we haven't got time we didn't we didn't we didn't have time <laughs> we didn't even have time to talk about didgeridoos uh, you know I, i'm gonna have to put that picture up of you and me battling at tedx reading with the didgeridoo and the baseball bat oh my god you with the baseball bat and me with the didgeridoo that was epic it was epic pop, 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 that, epic. that was epic i was expecting you saying i am your father but for thanks god you did it <laughs> You're gonna say strange looking man not my father <laughs> yeah, but, um no I'll sit on a serious note if there's anyone out there that um, um that has just listened to this or watched this and said Do you know what i really need to get engaged with it or, or into what simone's programs are about or you know i need to get to a webinar or an event or anything that simone's doing because i just i love the style and i think you know i believe that you're the right fit how can people connect with you or, or, or get access to uh, the programs and events that you do? Yeah, well, thank you for, uh, for asking, Katana. I really appreciate it. I think that uh, a great skill to have is selling from the stage because once uh, you have that skill, then uh, it, it, it's almost like your ticket to financial freedom mm. because it doesn't matter. You create a product that you love, that you believe in, that can really serve the audience. You have that skill, then you can always monetize it. And it doesn't matter if it's your event or other people's event. So a lot of people were asking me, what do I do first? What do I do second? What do I do third? And it was very, a lot of confusion around that. So what I created is a, a selling from stage checklist. So where I tell you what to do first, what to do second, what to do third, what to say third, all the things that you need to consider to create a great sales pitch that convert without being a douchebag. <laughs> it's just like Perfect. the most important thing. So if you want to get that one, you can go to our website, which is www dot gtex g t e x dot org dot uk you will find it on the front page you can download it and then we will send you updates on our regular events that we do um uh, first Tuesday of every month in, uh, in London, in central London. Fantastic. So I'll be putting the link onto this uh, live very, very shortly. But um, for anyone Thank that's picked it up, it's gtex.org.uk. Guys, go and get this stuff. I mean, Simone has been crafting his trade for years now. You know, you don't become a, uh, a you know, award winning speaker, a TEDx speaker doing 200 events, hustling, laughing, joking, have a relationship where you love the fact that your partner loves to put you in the calendar to all these kind of things, basically, unless you're someone like this man over here. So listen, on behalf of Enterprise Lab and the League of Disruption Set, I am so, so pleased that you took the time out. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been, it's been a laugh. Of, it's just been a laugh all the way through. And, um, and I'm going to see you really, really soon. Yeah, see you guys, thank you. Okay.